we all agree, is one of the best missions for exoplanets. And that seems, that seems like a good thing. But I think we can all agree that really, the test has been secretly, all along, a stellar activity, a stellar variability mission. Um, and so I'm going to highlight some of the interesting astrophysics. And by highlight astrophysics, what I really mean is uh, I'm going to play show and tell. Uh, because the thing that's got me excited about TESS is that every, roughly every month, far faster than I can keep up, keep up with, uh, a dump of 20,000 short cadence light curves shows up on my computer that I download and then I scratch my head and ponder how I'm going to look through them all. Um, and really, I think TESS is, is arguably as impactful for stars as it is for exoplanets. So, uh, George showed this great uh, publication rate, which I just anticipate will continue to go up like, keep publishing. This is an amazing mission. Um, and arguably, I mean, astrophysics, there's some other astrophysics, but really, come on, really, we're talking about stars. <laughs> like, 50 50. Um, there was a great website, I want to give a shout out and recognition, this great website that went up um, after Sector Zero, Sector Zero, Sector One, excuse me, um, which was called Test Roulette. I think the URL was test.casino. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that website is, is down, so I don't know if, if Ben is. Uh, able to buy the domain again or whatever, but like this was a great website. And so this uh, this website, you could hit the, the hit me, and it was like playing uh, a slot machine in Vegas, and it would just bring up a new light curve, and then they added more buttons that like if you got a jackpot, I think it would tweet about it, um, and then there was one that it would like pretend to submit a paper to the archive if you found a planet. <laughs> it was a great it was a great website, and and became a really useful simple tool for people to just click through and explore light curves and really appreciate uh, how dynamic and how interesting these light curves are. Um, so I've been doing a similar thing occasionally on Tuesdays. So we're going to pretend it's Tuesday today. I've been doing a similar thing where I've just been doing like Twitter threads about like cool light curves. So every month or two I'm like, let's just go click through a lot of light curves and just play show and tell about the things that get me excited. And that's what I want to do today. So this is how, this is my workflow, is I, I use the little uh, icon view on my Mac, and I just look through thousands of light curves. It's a very efficient system, actually. It's a computer vision algorithm, um, <laughs> whereby I look for things like this. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff in here. I mean, you could you could spend the whole talk if this was an incredibly high resolution projector. We could spend the whole talk just looking at this. There's so many cool wiggly things here that should excite everyone in this audience, even those handful of planetary astronomers. Um, so, so let's play a little show and tell. First thing that popped out to me, and I highlighted here, Sector 1. This was, again, in the first days of the test primary mission. Uh, eruptive variables, CVs, cataclysmic variables, dwarf novae, things that go bang um, out of nowhere. This thing increased by, this is relative flux here, so 20, 22 times relative flux. I forget, this has some, like, this is some name brand CV, which Paul Scotty is going to be very disappointed that I don't remember the name of, but um, these are all known uh, dwarf novae or outbursting CVs. These are incredible, uh, and and the light curves, like what we have from Kepler and K2, are incredibly dynamic. There's amazing uh, pulsations and variability, and this thing changes um, as it goes through. These are different systems, I should say. Uh, but the, the variability changes as they evolve. These are really, really neat events. There is an unbelievable number of what appear to be rotating stars, star spots, stellar rotation. Uh, sorry, there's all the kinds of colorful lines. This is my, these are literally just ripped out of my simple little pipeline of fitting Loam Scarborough periods to things. Um, there's so many little periodic variables in this data set. Uh, already, TESS has observed m as many stars as Kepler has, and we have a, a, a comparable number of rotating variables in the data set. Um, so here's just a truly random subset of rotating variables. So uh, for those who don't study these kind of diagrams all the time, this is a dark spot, like a sunspot, on the surface of the star, and as the star rotates, the spot rolls into the, uh, uh, the front of the star, makes it dimmer, and then it gets brighter as it rolls off, and you get these quasi-sinusoidal modulations. We can measure fundamental stellar properties, including rotation period and age, perhaps, with these. This is a really fascinating measure. Here, actually, there's two, if you look really carefully. There's two periods in here. Um, this was an amazing result from the Kepler mission that we've been working on in the K2 data, um, where you can see the distribution. This is Gaia color, and this is rotation period. And stars lose angular momentum, move upward in this diagram. Um, and so this is our sort of our age metric as they move upwards and lose angular momentum. We can see interesting structures in here in Kepler and K2. There's hints of structure here at the rapid rotating end. 
Uh, now, these slower rotators are going to be a big challenge because TESS only observes these stars for notionally 27 days or so. That's a really hard, you know, the sun rotates at 25 days. That becomes really difficult to measure. Um, but there's some hope. Um, there's pulsators. I only found one in the one folder of images that I was looking at, but there's a ton of pulsating light curves. So this is uh, probably some kind of RL light or something. Um, this is an amazing variable. Uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of interesting long-term large co R that we're going to see that are going to be really fun. And there are so, so many eclipsing binaries. And I know this is particularly the bane of the other half of the test mission, uh, those people who want to study the planets, because these things tend to show up as looking like really big planets. But they're amazing, and there's so much fundamental classical astrophysics we can do with eclipsing binaries. Um, now, you see that there's often a data gap here in the middle of the test data. There are always, I guess, a data gap here in the middle of the sector. And you get these funny cases where you get very strange looking light curves, like this is, looks like a Batman logo or something that's missing the primary transit. So a little bit of care has to be taken when you're trying to discover eclipsing binaries here. Uh, but, I mean, I, I look at this and I just, I just freak out because it's an amazing variety of possibilities. Like, this, this little feature here, this little bump, between this extremely eccentric eclipsing binary. This is some, uh, like, a heartbeat star kind of activity where it's tidally exciting it. Um, here's one that probably would get uh, mistaken off, offhand for, an eclipse, uh, for a transient planet. Look how long this eclipse is. This eclipse is like three days long. This is amazing. And it's a flat bottom eclipse. This is a really cool system. Um, I think there's a possibility here with TESS, perfect, given the all, nearly all sky coverage, to have the first, like, complete census of eclipsing binaries out to 20, 30 days uh, over the whole sky. I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, and there's opportunities really cool. Talk to Jessica Berkey here from UW about cool methods to classify these things uh, with fancy statistics and machine learning techniques. Uh, here's one that I found uh, the other day that looks like it's a heartbeat star. And I remember when Bill Welsh showed one of the first one of these at the Kepler, from the Kepler Science meetings and said, ah, I must have my magnitudes wrong. This must be an eclipse, and it's not. It's a, and it's an eclipsing binary, but it's tidal excitation every time the, the two stars get close to each other. These are amazing systems. And we have these zones of continuous viewing, or nearly continuous viewing, where we have the opportunity to look for very long period systems. And I think this is where we'll sur even surpass, or eclipse, if you will, uh, the Kepler mission uh, uh, in terms of looking for very long period variables. So there's great opportunities here for long-term studies of variables. And it really goes on and on and on. Massive stars, evolved stars, O and B stars, they all vary. Flare stars, of course, they go pop uh, all the time. There's a, a huge number of flare stars and young stars in the test data that I'm excited to talk to you about ad nauseum. Uh, here's a good example of what test Kepler 1. The uh, same star observed in Kepler, and then we observed it again in test. Uh, obviously not continuously. <laughs> uh, we can do statistics, and the statistics line up. And it's exciting, right? There's fun overlap things we can do with this data set. Blah, blah, blah. We can talk about this. Okay. The conclusion. The conclusion is, uh, TESS really is one of the most powerful astrophysics missions. Like its precursor, like its uh, predecessors, Kepler and K2, TESS is going to change what we know about the nearby and bright stars in our galaxy. And I think it's going to unlock or solve puzzles, or whatever the uh, symbol I'm trying to elicit here is, it's going to solve a lot of mysteries. And of course, that means whenever we're probing a new parameter space, it's going to open up all new ones. Thank you. <laughs> two, two seconds to spare, so I get one question, and then I can scratch my head. <laughs> Hi. You mentioned before that there is a citizen science project looking for planets. Is any of this information incorporated into those citizen science projects, and how can citizen scientists discover variable stars, pulsars, pulsating stars? I'm going to make Andrew answer this, because I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I believe that they do have uh, categories that they classify other variables. I'm not sure exactly which categories they are. Is there anyone here from Planet Hunters? But I will note that in the Kepler mission, Voyage of the Star was discovered by amateur astronomers. So I wonder how many truly fascinating things Tess will discover, not by most people in this room. All right, let's thank Jim again.